want. Recording is on. So this is the uh, Fellowship of the Link call for Wednesday, February 15th, 2023. Hello from the past. Yeah. Um, and what does the agenda remind you of from last call that we were going to? Yeah, I think we have a few. So so let's go. We can do that very shortly, and perhaps we can do check-ins uh, if you want. So some threads, uh, Aram has brought up uh, the archiving tool slash link card generator uh, to discuss at some point. I I had uh, brought up interwiki links and the common hub approach for search and entity resolution. I guess we have discussed that and I added it. Uh, meaning, you know, how to cross link between uh, different, like, you know, massive wikis, agoras, gardens, etc. And then we had further back, and I think I re-added this because, like, uh, we discussed last time, we had, like, uh, whether we want to define a calendar or use a calendar to synchronize, keep track of all the different, like, uh, things in this space that uh, we are attending. And also, issue tracker or project tracker if you want to do like bugs or something for share projects and also the wiki uh, or root url you know like where to like start adding for example if we had a calendar where would the link to the calendar be right <laughs> so that's what uh, we have um, so pete kimmensi started a calendar for ogm and other orgs which is over here uh, which we, I'm certain, could use, or we may want to uh, have some other sort of flavor of calendar. But that exists mm -hmm. as an attempt to say where are standing calls, how do you join them, where are their archives, all that kind of stuff. <clears throat> and then, and then I have a topic, Blancian. I wanted to figure out how you and I and anybody else on this call who wants to can share notes, and and what does that mean? Uh, and and kind of kind of what does it mean is an interesting conversation. I'd like to keep going on. To share notes right here, right now, like in the song from the office. Um, uh, the calendar sounds very good. I'm just reviewing. Mm -hmm. oh, it's a treasure, yes. oh, cool. I have never seen this. Thank you. It sort of fits so. Um, and I, 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 I have some kind of a calendar block somewhere in my neural systems because when I travel, I will often misplace or displace uh, appointments into the wrong zone. I don't really know how to set my Google Calendar properly or how to set up new appointments properly when they're in other time zones in the future. Uh, it, makes, it makes me cranky because then I, I like, you know, move things around wrong. So, and then every time I've tried to do a group calendar to do like OGM called early on, I did something wrong and everybody was getting duplicate invites or something stupid like that. And I'm like, no, 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 I'm, I'm just not gifted in the calen calendric direction. Don't know what it is about calendars. So um, just while we're talking calendars, uh, uh, yeah, I, I, I guess I'm surprised that Pete's using um, Google Sheet. I, yeah, I guess the problem with like, regular calendar software is that they're not by week and they don't handle the time zone display really well. I've been wanting to build something that would take an iCal file and display it in the time zone of the person that's viewing it based on their um, browser settings and then give them the chance to change it. I haven't had time. Um, in, uh, Vincent in um, Trove has... Um, Calendaring system where they it automatically sends out invites um, that work in most calendar systems, I think. Mm -hmm. So it depends on what we're doing. But I've been wanting to make a JavaScript viewer and also an availability calendar viewer that shows the time that are that are open and can download and can look at multiple iCal links and then consolidate it to just show you the open times for use on my own web page for the same eye availability. So awesome. there's some calendar stuff. It's all pretty easy to do. It's just finding the time. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. No pun intended. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, I've been using Nextcloud calendar uh, with social Coop. Yes, completely, yes. We are like, uh, <laughs> before I mentioned, we are all like uh, 
uh, like nice bugs tra trapped in, in amber. But uh, yes, uh, um, yeah, next cloud calendar is, is seems to work and it does some uh, how I call support and so on. Uh, but I don't know if we have any next cloud instance. I didn't know that next cloud had a calendar feature. So yeah, it seems okay. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm also using Google's. I mean, I work, of course, but like, um, and I'm used to it. I sort of like it, but yeah, and this cloud seems fine. But I think it's pretty is actually, uh, you know, and it has already the right information, it seems. So for me, I'm very much for MVP and like, uh, for a VC, it sounds perfect, yeah. And for reducing duplication of effort. Yeah, yeah. And 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 then once we have the spreadsheet, of course, we, if, if I think we can try different things, as in, you know, just take the spreadsheet and port it to uh, to any to next cloud or whatever, and then we can just show it to the group and, right. and that's how we switch. So as a concern, a concern we have a calendar. Also, and anything anything else about calendar? What do we want? Not for me. Thank you for that. Yeah, about how to share notes. Uh, that I really like that topic. Uh, it's a thing. Um, uh, Peter is not here. Yes. yes. Uh, uh, but uh, I don't know if he was also interested, but uh, yes. Um, so, what do you think? Um, <laughs> um, <laughs> um, uh, yes, how should we do it? What do you think? Um, so, I, I, I think I want to. I'm interested in what different, whoever has an opinion about what this looks like on this call, I'd love to hear what you think this this, this is shaped like. Um, my minimum viable sort of product or prototype on this is markdown files that we have sort of uh, shared edit privileges over and we you know awkwardly control access uh, contention over, but that's okay, That's a, that's a very nice start because we're a bunch of us are kind of using massive wiki as a wiki proxy that isn't really a wiki, but sort of is a wiki. And that unfortunately, because it doesn't implement CRDT or any other kind of contention management protocol, leaves us with contention problems and merging problems if we screw that up. Um, but I'm, I'm good with that because if we can start to build out these, these wiki spaces. And then uh, just to add to the, to the problematic of issues, um, once you're talking GitHub or Wikis and then Obsidian, you're talking vaults and repos and namespaces and a bunch of other stuff that don't elegantly dovetail together. And one of the, one of my dislikes of Obsidian is that when you change vaults, your settings don't travel with you. So you suddenly got to reinstall and reconfigure everything, uh, which is kind of ridiculous. Um, and so, and so, so, so my MVP offer for note sharing is layered with these funny little complexities that I'm not that crazy about. Um, so open to other visions of what note sharing kind of looks like and means uh, and, and on from there. And then one last thing on the MVP, my MVP of note sharing doesn't really include sharing the web of links that I see in the brain. Um, and I mentioned, I think, uh, Monday on the Free Jury's Brain Call that I have a, an open question in front of Harlan Hugh, the brains inventor, about, hey, wouldn't it be cool if I could swap out their notes editor, which they rewrote from scratch just last year, I think, um, for uh, Obsidian pointing wherever I put my files or whatever. Because right now I can go write a file in Obsidian, push it over to GitHub, go to the website builder, massive wiki builder, find the URL to the new page over there because I can't get it from Obsidian. That doesn't actually work. And maybe that's easy to do because it, it should be relatively, it should be very right. simple to generate. If you can infer it, yeah. Exactly. If you can infer it, you should be able to come up with the name of the page. Um, and then I can add that new page to my brain manually. And that is a really long runaround. But the result is that in my brain, then I would be pointing to that page, except it wouldn't be editable to anybody showing up. It would just look like a website web page, right? So that, that's that's clumsy and not really very highly functional whatsoever. And what I'm trying to do is cut through that so that as a brain user, I can collaborate sharing the brain web thing. And on Monday, we also did a brief screen share of the new um, the new web client for the brain called Vulcan. Have you guys seen it? Uh, Brent, Bentley, you were on Monday's call, right? Yeah, so you've seen it. Yeah. Um, maybe I should do a really brief screen share so that you all are familiar with it. Let me actually find it and uh, make sure it's running properly. 
<clears throat> there we go. And then I have to do screen share in uh, this app, which is harder than usual. What, uh, what was the app called? Uh, <clears throat> the, the app is, so, so the beta, the name for the beta for the new web client is Vulkan. Uh, and here's, a, I'll point to a, uh, I will point to a post from Harlan about Vulkan. Here we go. Uh, here's the link on Vulkan. Copy attachment and then paste. And then because I'm screen recording, I don't know when I do screen sharing what that's going to do, but we will find out shortly. Um, so let me try to do a screen share of that. Group. Um, and uh, where'd it go? Oh, and while, while you're thinking of that, yep. um, it's been a while since I looked at it, but when you share Obsidian vaults, there is a, and it may be a folder with a dot in front of it, so it disappears on some systems. Right. But there's a folder that holds all the settings, and you can put a vault into a subfolder on your system so that when Obsidian looks at it, it uses your local preferred settings rather than the settings someone else dictated for that vault, which helps create all kinds of issues with conflicts and sh things shifting around. Right. Um, but the problem is it's a kind of programmer level type of thing. You have to know it exists and how to get around it yep. to be able to, to get around that thing. Um, but I've done it reasonably successfully with a handful of shared vaults that groups of us use. So you download the thing and you essentially put it, put the shared vault into a subfolder of your own, and then it defaults to using your preferred methods. Um, yeah. If I can find some directions for it, I, I'll give you a link or dump them somewhere. Thank you. The other, the other thing I'll note there is like if you do shared vaults with um, Dropbox, you can instruct Dropbox to ignore the dot Obsidian folder. Um, and then Obsidian will populate it automatically the first time you open the vault. Hmm. And also you can copy paste it in like uh, like uh, Chris was talking about. The other thing I'd note is like, I don't know. That's like the, the way they manage the .obsidian folder is sort of my least favorite thing about Obsidian because it is one folder, but it includes like your plugin configuration, but also like your last document to open. So if you're sharing a vault with someone and that's shared, you end up with their last document open instead of your last document open. It's a little messy. Yeah, more, more messiness. Uh, is everybody seeing my shared screen of the web client? Yes. For the brain? Okay, so Nikola Tesla on screen. Um, and this, uh, so uh, historically, the brain web client has always been inferior to the desktop and has sort of, sort of not been as happy doing things. Uh, what's happened now is they re this is a prototype, but they're rewriting it and now adding back features. But the eye icon on the upper right here, if you click on the eye, it switches between the Plex view, the brain's default view, and this basically Windows frames, you know, uh, browser frames view. Uh, and so here's Nikola Tesla and, uh, you know, in, uh, and, and all the links that were in the display I just had are basically uh, here again. So here are parent thoughts, almost famous, ball lightning, et cetera, et cetera. If I switch, what it's doing by default is it goes through the parent thoughts and shows you all the children of that parent one at a time. So that's what's happening on the left here is it's going through each of those and right this minute, there's no way to limit how many things it shows. So the parent, the parent display is kind of messed up that way. Uh, but this is just code. You could change it around. Um, and my wish is to be able to get to a page where there's an editor here that is just whatever editor you like. And if it's Obsidian or whatever else, and you can kind of plug it in or swap it in, then you're off to the races, uh, editing directly in the brain. Now, the brain has a native uh, editor, which is not featured in the web client version. At least I don't think it is. Um, let's see, if I go to Trust Your Resonance, I don't get an edit thing of any kind down here. So, um, but the brain itself, uh, every thought, here's my, my this is my uh, new note 
my new thought for this for today's uh, call in this sequence. And uh, so there's a notes field down below, uh, which is the new notes editor that they rewrote recently, which is a full Markdown editor plus plus. Like it's a it's a it's an all singing, all dancing kind of editor because they discovered that they were using something like Easy Easy Editor or something before as a plugin, and a third of their support calls were for um, problems with the editor. So they're like, let's just rewrite the editor. Um, anyway, that's just sort of by by means of show and tell there. Cool. Did they, did they discuss like an API? An API? So I they haven't talked so much about an API, and they haven't had an API for a while because it sort of forces them to lock things down. I, at least that's the reasoning. And it would be lovely to have an API. So I don't I don't know. I I, I want to ask about that. Oh, and one more and and one more thing is my intention is to next time I talk with Harlan to describe if I can, conceptually, my desire for there to maybe be any and Audi brains, where what he's been building all along is an any brain, which means you create notes for yourself in the brain in the notes editor. And that means that he has full control over where the file is and how to index it and all that. So search is fast, all that. But if you did Audi brains, you then let you, that suddenly greatly increases the shareability of the brain files because those Audi files can exist in shared volumes. Uh, that, 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 that's exactly what we've been talking about here. And because early on when I first configured the brain, there was a feature that let you index any web page you pointed to. It would index the contents of that page and make them searchable. I turned that off at the beginning because I knew back then how quickly text search indices grow large. And I, I made a couple decisions way back then to keep the brain data file from like growing to some gargantuan extent which mostly most of which I'm happy to have done but I don't think you know that they're not if resources weren't a, weren't an issue they're not the, the kind of choices I, I I might have made for the long run but I say that because indexing of a page hosted somewhere else doesn't seem ever to have been a problem for the brain so why not Audi files instead of only just any files that you create so with that I am complete on this uh this wish list for what would make the brain a better note sharing and right. you know a heterogeneous note sharing mm -hmm. uh, tool. Right, right. So, so if you want to pick up from that Plancian and say like, what does that mean for Agora and and for right, Korea, yeah. that'd be perfect. Yeah, happy to. I mean, um, so as 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 most of you will know, like uh, the Agora is like the vision of the Agora is that you tell an Agora where your notes are. Uh, and notes, you know, can stand for, you know, like your personal knowledge graph, uh, the links themselves uh, in different formats, but essentially where your like, uh, you know, digital garden is uh, uh, to like maybe settle on that metaphor. And the Agora will try to integrate it for you and just keep doing it. So it's like, you know, one time sign sign in will be ideal. And then you can just continue to use your, your workflows as they are and mostly ignore the Agora if you want until you need it. And uh, on top of these, there's like a bunch of async flows that you know we're experimenting with. Like you know, maybe you write something in your notes, and then the Agora does something for you just by reading it in your notes. So it's like it becomes like yet another reader. But that's more on your UI level. On the what it does now is really it just imports. A, a few sources uh, of which the most common is Git, just like a Git repository. You tell it a Git repository, and then it says like sure, and then every thirty seconds, currently an average or something, the Agora, the reference Agora, it will just Git pull. And if it ever it runs into a problem because you did something uh, uh, that uh, you know breaks Git pull, it will just recron your repository. It tries to like just get that data and like uh, keep a copy. Um, and that's pretty much uh, what it does uh, uh, per, per garden. And then it tries to integrate many different gardens within a, one single Agora using heuristics, right? So, you know, if if we all have like a node called FOTL or fellowship link or any variation we can inform, they that will all show up one after the other in some order in a, a, a location, a, a node in the share. So it's a share graph. It's, uh, conceptually, it's like taking a lot of brains or other gardens uh, to mix metaphors again and like, whoosh, try to like uh, integrate them naively, but eventually, uh, hopefully, uh, with uh, with greater uh, utility and like uh, sophistication. Uh, now, um, 
so on, on the most concrete, the most common uh, format that's important is Markdown, right? But it can also import, import the org mode. And we also have uh, FedWiki, which is like, well, actually, it's like it's text, you know, it's actually a wiki format. Sometimes I mix format and, and repository or like a medium, no? But, uh, and, and some tools are like both, both a strong medium and a, and a format. So, you know, but in any case, uh, so Marlon Ormo, some wiki formats, uh, like Nicorisa, the Federico one, and uh, some HTML. Actually, actually, there are some people who we have like a medium backup, for example, there, and like a, a one or two WordPress sites. So in this context, and the, so this shapes what I think, I mean, okay, this is actually shaped by how, how I think about not sharing, uh, clearly. But the idea will be like, if you, and this will be like my default proposal for sharing is like, uh, if you give me, uh, or uh, and, and, and Peter as well, you know, like a, uh, like a one URL where you can say, if you start reading here, you will see my notes. And optionally, uh, and of course, if that URL is a Git repository and it has Marlon, the easiest, and that will just work out the logs. But even if it's a website and you say, this is under this website, there are my notes, and the pages are uh, following this URL convention, that's also good enough. Uh, the idea is that the Agora wants to adapt to where people, the, the Agora wants to meet the user where they are, essentially, uh, in a very basic, but hopefully uh, useful way. Mm -hmm. Um, so yeah, I mean, so essentially, TL, uh, like TLDR is like plus one to Markdown on Git uh, when in, when in doubt. Uh, just also because it, I think it makes it so that people can go from tool to tool uh, pretty easily. Uh, but HTML uh, or no or org mode or actually, if you tell me the format you want, I mean, uh, actually, one of the things I want to do next is like use Pandoc, mm -hmm. uh, uh, like a universal engine, and then it's like it, we. Pretty much don't care anymore. Like if, right. if Pando can take the document, the Agora will render it uh, and, and let the community uh, collaborate. Uh, this is all individual. So I wanted to make a distinction, and before I will shut up uh, in, in 30 seconds. Oh, that's great. <laughs> so that's on the digital garden side, which is what it does. It's like you know a bunch of digital gardens, blah, 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 and then like smooshing them together or something. Um, Strictly speaking, it doesn't care about is it a GDR, is it a wiki, is it like it's just Git repositories and Marlon or Ormo. But we do make the distinction sort of semantic between repositories which are like maintained by one person, which is like what they usually digital gardens are, and repositories which are like more wiki like, where like you have multi user editing, which is I think what you were also like discussing, uh, Jerry, when it comes to like contention and like conflict resolution. Yep. So, my my hunch is that, and this is my hypothesis actually, is that starting with individual gardens is the is the MVP, right? Because then we can see how we all think before tackling the idea of how to think together. Well, I mean, the mere act of of linking yes. through a shared leaf node from a single user world into somebody else's single user world suddenly turns that little leaf node into a multi-user, multi, you know. Exactly. Yeah. This is, this is a, the, the, hopefully, I mean, it could be the value prop essentially. Right. Here. It's like, but, but the, the, the nice thing, and this is what I was referring to, is like, essentially, you know, you can ignore it until you, you want it, uh, do not ignore it. And actually, once you start doing that, you start spotting all these opportunities for collaboration. Right. So we bootstrap, and then we can say, oh, okay, so for example, like uh, once you're in the same hour, or in, uh, I'm sure it's the same as the wiki, it will be like, oh, we want to collaborate on a project, say a word, right? <laughs> like we can say like uh, a, a Plex calendar. Chris or, has the longest city name and is like memorized, so he, that could be the word. Exactly. And then, and then it's, I mean, just that, that information because we are all, uh, if we all assume, oh, when we don't know where to resolve things together as a group, we're going to go to this point, to this hour, or this massive wiki. That the, the hypothesis is that, that over time in groups lowers the uh, friction to collaboration. And then we, we can even like use that to say, okay, we're going to collaborate on this wiki or in this document, share document, where we solve the, um, you know, cooperation, uh, the, the, the simultaneous cooperation like uh, problems. Uh, exactly. <laughs> um, uh, uh, you know, after we have done this groundwork, mm -hmm. that would be my proposal. 
Um, Bentley, you've messed around with the brain sum. Does this smell correct? Are we in the right general direction? Uh, I actually got distracted by an incoming mail. So no worries. <laughs> I didn't hear any of that, and I don't want to make Lance enough to repeat the 10 minute speech. To be honest, like Marlon on Git, and like uh, any other format is also fine if we define it. Yeah. I'm sure we could make anything work. Cool. Um, and Chris, any thoughts? I think one of the toughest parts is how you provide context into these things, particularly for people who are new. So it's, you know, a, a small short note just by itself is one thing, but then that combined with the context versus let's say a full Wikipedia page that may have, here's an idea in 57 sub ideas, which provides a lot more context than just my one note about this specific one thing. And I, I, to me, that's the harder sense making piece for larger groups is how do you help the person who's coming in find that pointer? You know, you may come into the middle of a conversation and having missed the beginning, you're totally lost. But how do you kind of better contextualize that? And that's a, a second level problem that you have to be careful of in, in fixing that first level problem. Um, but I think there are enough trails and paths within what the Agora does that you can go back. You just have to know what the UI is, what the affordances are, and where those trails go. Or, you know, it's like watching Jerry's brain, having seen you use it, I know how you have your general layout. So I know what to expect by going up into the left or down into the right or what's a parent, what's a child and where I'm going. And once I know what those paths look like, it makes a whole lot more sense to me versus mm -hmm. I show up out of nowhere and then here's a page and what the hell's going on. Yeah, I love that. So there's a sense so those, of those UI things. There's a sense of orientation when you land someplace. Um, and I was thinking, Flancian, as you were talking, that it might be interesting and useful as an automated footer for new pages to, to auto-generate a footer that says, oh, this page is shared in a, some Venn diagram form in these other, these other projects or namespaces or personal note spaces so that you knew, <clears throat> each of which has ground rules. And then, and then there could be access controls on an individual page that could be made sort of visible, like, hey, this is any, everybody's free to comment. Uh, you have to apply to edit. Uh, here's who to apply to kind of thing or something like that on any page. And then the page could wind up sort of skinning down to a lowest common denominator ho uh, without hopefully losing too much metadata from any of the tools. Um, and, and then again, this begs the question of, hey, what happens to the cool shit that each of the individual tools can do that isn't, right. that doesn't inhabit a plain markdown file? Completely. Yes. Uh, what the Agora does, uh, really, uh, the UI is, needs to improve, by the way. Uh, when we know where else, like a sub node or like a resource, which is like, you know, a, a, a particular individual contribution in a node, when we know where where else it is hosted uh, or or rendered, we surface that. So yeah. it's an icon. It could be made way more. Uh, the, we need an animation bar, actually. It, it doesn't have one. Uh, uh, and and you could Im totally imagine like actually up ranking that, which is the idea, I think, like making it more like actually should be more notable probably. Um, uh, yeah, and all the access controls and so on. Yes, it doesn't do any of that, but it should. Uh, of like you know, if you want to collaborate, you have to write this. This is the process where you could actually uh, you know get there. Yeah. Right. Cool. I mean, I do like that the Agora has. There's a frame that gives me kind of a bubble graph of my idea that I'm looking at on this page and what it links to kind of going out within one or two links. And that helps center where you're at. Although I find, I don't, I don't think it does it the same way every time. So the bubbles may move around, which is one of the issues I have with how Obsidian's graph renders is I can see a view, but it's not the same place. So you know, the world shifts around me every time I look at that graph, which 
which is my problem with the rubber band. It's my always my problem with the rubber band view. There's no sense of of orientation. That's but actually it's, pretty, it's, it's fun, it's but so shiny. It's not useful. Yeah, it's force graph. I put that together like very quickly, but I completely agree. Uh, sometimes I drag the nodes, and I want to say just keeping them like this, you know. And I, I was thinking of having a mode in which, like, by default, it does that only once, and then it saves. And if a user actually arranges the graph a hand, the next user sees the same arrangement. Mm -hmm. That just would make sense, right? Uh, but that's that's next. It may be a tree view as well instead of like just a graph. Yeah. You, you have yeah. to be careful doing that though, because user one may have the way, you know, I want it to look like Jerry's brains layout. Yeah. And then Bentley comes along and says, no, I hate that. Let's shift it all around. And then, then I come back and visit it again next week. And then suddenly it's. How do you, how do you preserve each person's preferences on view while allowing other people to mess with the data and preserving the ways that they improve the data, that's that's like the sweet spot question in the middle here. Right. I mean, I always find that that graph is less useful for me as a tool for finding things and more useful as a tool for understanding the things that need to be linked that aren't. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I, I don't mind that it resorts every time. It's weird, but yeah, I understand that. Uh, and with the brain, it kind of resorts every time, but there's always a known orientation and things are always above or below or to the left of, of other things. So by what I mean by dynamic resorting is that before I ever saw the brain, I was looking for some kind of mind mappy sort of tool. And I thought I wanted the placement of nodes like in the game of Go, where it matters where you, what, what, which intersection of, of lines you're on. And I learned when I, when I hit the brain, I'm like, oh shit, you can't do that for n dimensions when you have n things underneath. You can't have any new node relative to all the other nodes. That would be like exhausting. <clears throat> and therefore, the brain's convention of, hey, you make a decision up, down, left, right, and then everything that's down gets sorted either alphabetically or chronologically, make your choice. And, and I'm good with that because the I is really good at parsing through columns that are alphabetic, for example. That, that, that just really works clean because I, mm -hmm. I know where to go for something that, that I, I think seem to remember where it started. That plus some really quick text search and you're like really rocking and rolling. Yeah. So I, you showed the Vulcan thing a few minutes ago. And I, that's, you know, I've landed on a crazy planet. I don't know where things got remapped to so i don't know where so the first thing i try to do is figure out okay here are the couple of things that he showed in the first view here's where they are in the second view okay now i've kind of reoriented myself and it's understandable again but at least knowing i'm in the west side of the country right then i can look around and find things that i expect to be on the west side and that's orienting but that may be tougher for a multi-user space. And I, I have sort of, I kind of have uh, uh, design issues for an OGM platform. I'll share that link um, somewhere. I had orientation, uh, but that was very much about the Zoom levels and a couple other things we've talked about in these calls. This this window is using seven gigs of RAM. It's because we're thinking big thoughts, Aram. And your AI is busy trying to like trace the trace their origins and everything else. It's... Yeah, I think just something wrong with something on my device. Oh, there could be. Not the client itself. It could be that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He calls it a gypsy. Um. So. I, I, I love this discussion, but I want to steer it. I, I'm going to be uh, honest. I want to steer it slightly in the direction of uh, knowing which URLs have your notes uh, if you if you if you have them published somewhere. Sure. I um, and, and and so that's kind of like a hmm. What do you mean by that? Uh, because I'm using massive wiki posting markdown files to github repos and i can give you urls to all of those that's really super easy the brain i whenever i send somebody a link like i just did the brain shortcut link that link is unfortunately not auto generated when the brain is updated or posted that brain is generated that brain link is generated on the fly 
uh, and then shortened with the brain's own link shortener, which is probably a bad idea for, for longevity of links. Hmm. Um, but it gives me yeah. a, short, a short link to send you, right? Um, and and so you can see what is going to be about the link. Yeah. So this link doesn't give you a preview, doesn't give you anything. It just, it just says, hey, if you click here, I'm going to regenerate the brain display and take you to the node that Jerry just shared with you. And good luck with that. So that's ugly. Mm -hmm. um, even though in the brain's archive format, there's just a big bag of JSON objects, some of which are notes files, right? So, so in the brain's archive someplace, uh, the, these things exist. And, and Bentley, the reason I turned to you earlier is that the way that you and Marc Antoine were sort of working on the brain scrapers and Pete were working on the brain scrapers was as a read through cache, if I got this right, which was basically uh, what Chris was saying earlier, like let's start here and then as we traverse nearby, those things get read into our new little external copy of what's in the brain, uh, which sounds clumsy and duplicative, but quick and dirty. Yeah, it's a way of making sure we're up to date, but not um, thrashing their API. Yep. Um, so it's really more of a courtesy. And also, if their system ever, ever goes down, we have a chance of having some of the data. It's not a full right. update. Your brain short links do convert to a longer URL. Right. As soon, as you, as soon as you paste them in. Yeah. It, although the URL itself is not very helpful. Yeah. It's just two GUIDs, really. Yeah, no? Uh-huh. Um, but at least they're permanent, mm -hmm. um, which if you know the brain, then you could just store the relevant GUIDs. You don't even need the URL itself, which is how we use in Brainiac Brain Face. <laughs> I think we use a similar format. Mm -hmm. So, um, okay, so I have the real 8 repo, which is already in the Agora and the, the reference one. But also in the FODL hour, uh, which is like just the one I'm trying to set up for uh, for the fellowship. Uh, and I think Jerry, you said like you have one, you have at least one obsidian one and also the brain dump, you no? Know? Mm -hmm. So uh, if you want, we can try to integrate both. Um, I, so I think it'd be easy for us to integrate with the obsidian vaults uh, yeah, sure. and, and or GitHub repos, I, I guess, preferably. Um, although connecting at the Obsidian level is interesting. Now, I'm paying Obsidian like 10 bucks a month for Obsidian Sync. Oh, yeah. I so haven't the... never integrated that. I will be happy to give that a try, but the Git repo is way easier. Yeah, yeah. And, and Obsidian Sync is working nicely so that I can pick up my iPad and then work on the same document and pick up my phone and work on the same document that I was working on on the desktop. So that's kind of nice, but that's the only feature that buys me. Um, wow. And then I get confused about vaults versus repos versus whatevers. That, you know. I think we previously discussed, right? There is some plugin for Obsidian that syncs with Git very effectively. Yeah. yeah. I looked it up, but like I have so many weird features on my Git command line and because of security that I was just like, ah. it's much easier for me to just open up a command line. But um, that's probably not most people, so that might help. Uh, yeah. And in order to configure Obsidian to work for massive wiki, the first thing you do is get your Git account and install the Git plugin the, the, that syncs and make that work. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So we can definitely start by integrating that one. Yes. I mean, you already have this set up. And what, what about you, Aram, uh, Bentley, Chris? Wait, what was that? that you broke up? Hey, uh, sorry, are you interested in participating in the experiment of like smooshing the notes? Yeah, I just have to give you a location you can do it that doesn't have all the crap you don't want. <laughs> well, I mean, I am. Or all the crap I don't want you to have. There we go. Okay, that's that's, that's clear. Because I'm like, clear. There, it's, the, it's been intermingling with private and public data for so long. Wow. I'm actually, I'm still slowly teasing the two apart. Um, yeah. And Obsidian makes it reasonably easy that I can have a a superset and a subset. Um, so I'm trying to move things into a subset that I can sync and not have all of it. Um, yeah, so I, as an example with that, I've been playing around with this conceptually as well, um, which is like there's a problem of public and private. And so my little demo, which I put on the link here, is um, so I've run a, I'm running a, setting up to run a Dungeons and Dragons campaign mm -hmm. um, for some friends, right? And so, 
I keep my notes in Markdown and Obsidian, and I want to keep the notes there, but also like I want to generate a site with like updates to their profile pages and you know the basic rules like the system resource document and all of that. So um, one of the things I played with is this is a pre-commit hook. And the pre-commit hook goes into the appropriate folders that I want to store things that I want to be public facing to my players from my private Obsidian vault, copies it over into the GitHub repo and um, allows it so that it's always stays up to date with my notes and the site. Um, the other thing to do is like invert it is the next step, which is have my private repo automatically pull the things that are public, push them into the other repo and, and publish it. And the last piece that I want to apply here that I think would be useful is right now it's folder based. And I know this is sort of untraditional amongst uh, Obsidian users, but I am heavily invested in folders. It works for me. Um, but uh, what I want to do is just have it be in the YAML, right? So that I could just have it run um, a YAML check. If it says public colon true, that's what gets pulled into the thing. So that's the, I'm on step two right now. That's step three. We'll see. Thank you. Just for thinking that. about like how to deal with that public private diff. Yeah, exactly. And, and even just that user, that individual decision of to folder or not to folder makes such a big difference in the sharing and everything else we're talking about. It just has all these ramifications. Um, and I, I being a fan of wiki flat namespaces, I'm trying to use Obsidian by just naming files in some way that lets me sort of see them consistently in the namespace without building a whole lot of folders. I had at a previous Obsidian uh, vault where I did a bunch of folders and I was like, that's some, something about this just isn't working for me. I think I'm using folders because Obsidian has a nice folder view. Um, but I'm a big fan of wiki namespaces and wiki collaborations and trying to figure out how do we find our way back to that being simple here. Yeah, I mean, the flip side of this is like, even though I have folders, I also alias everything um, and handle it that way. Um, so like functionally, I use it like it's a flat um, wiki thing, but like in in my organization, it's in folders because that's the easiest way for me to handle it. Mm -hmm. You want to try out something really interesting that sort of like takes it the other direction. Um, I was trying this uh, Markdown based authoring tool called Deep Down. That's D W N, um, and it is like built four folders explicitly, mm -hmm. and it has the most fascinating design. Con concept, which is um, when you open a folder in it, it gives you four columns. The first is, um, you know, your folder structure. The second column is all of the files in your current hierarchical level. So it'll show you all of the files in your current folder and all the folders below it. Then the third column is your um, your headers. And then the fourth column is your authoring interface. Um, and I found it's very useful for writing single files, like long form single files, which is cool. But very, like the, when I opened it, I was like, what the hell is this? I have no idea what's going on. But now that I've realized, I'm like, oh, this is, I get it. It's intended to make it easy for me to switch between the stuff that I'm working on at the particular hierarchy level I'm working on. Mm -hmm. Which is cool. Oh, speaking of waving, I gotta go pick up a kid who's getting out of school early today. So, nice. Enjoy. Save the video, and I'll catch the tail end. Cool. Thank you. You're only gonna miss 12 minutes of video. So, <laughs> uh, there's also um, I haven't tried deep down, but the, I don't know if you've seen Dendron for uh, VS Code has like these sort of like a readily opinionated uh, taxonomy structure related to folders, uh, using folders. And also, not only folders, if I remember correctly, but uh, encoding like, you know, hierarchical information in the actual file name 
separated by, separated by periods. So you could essentially have something like a Java class or something in the file name, and it will actually be expressing uh, some hierarchy that way. Uh, this all on top of VS Code. I think it was, so yeah. Uh, Sounds like a great way to have very complicated file names. Yeah, yes. exactly. Uh, I, I like to be working on it, uh, but uh, yeah, I, I, it wasn't for me when I tried. I guess uh, I went for foam. Uh, what do you what do you call the uh, marketing cruft get, that gets put after the question mark at the end of URLs? What what do you call? Is there a name for for that horrible, horrible appendage? I mean, in mar in marketing, they're called UTM codes, even though you can do more than UTM codes there. Mm. I'd say. They're generally called campaign codes or um, URL decoration. URL decoration. It, oh, that's that's a really nice name. <laughs> yeah, it depends on it depends on how how much of a privacy advocate the person is. If right. they're a marketing person, they're going to call it UTM codes because they only think about it as UTM codes because that's how they started with it. Right. If you're a privacy person, you call it link decoration because then you are saying, "Look at all of this very nice dressing on this link. It's useless." For anything other than invading people's privacy, get rid of it. Right. Um, and then um, if you're talking to somebody like me who has professional requirements around these things, then you probably call it something like campaign codes. Oh, I think you were going to say something like shit. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> no. Well, no, no. I have to, like, there are parts of that that we use for real that we want to retain. Right. <laughs> Yeah. Right. I'm, I'm, I'm sometimes impressed at how long and stupid those codes are because I, I trim them out before I add anything to my, to my brain. Yeah, yeah. I need to trim everything after the question mark. Um, and sometimes it's, they just go on forever and they're full of crap and stuff that you're like, whoa, I didn't want that to be there. Yeah, no. I guess. It, it, sorry, go ahead. Some, sometimes after the question mark can, if you're doing deep links, Sometimes that's also a deep link info. So it's um, not every now and well, I, I yeah, once okay. I once I remove that stuff, I then test the link again to see if oh, it's, okay, yeah. it's kind yeah. of working. If it if that if, if then I'm broken, then I've got to figure out a different solution. But that doesn't yeah. happen that often. Yeah, completely. Yeah, the, the, the big thing is like you don't know which of the query uh, parameters are like needed and which aren't. And right. That's uh, maybe uh, should, in respect it could be part of a standard or something, but no. Right. Especially, Especially, it might be neat to make a little tool that pops them all up and you can just take out the ones you want and try yeah. it and see what it does. I found <laughs> I found a Chrome, yeah. a Chrome extension that cleans URLs and installed it a while ago, but it didn't seem to be doing the right job. So I got rid of it. But but it was like a clean URL thing. We could put that in the, UR, in the mosaic oh. um, tiles. Yeah, in the project to, to wish, for, wish for. Exactly. Um, yeah. I have I have that built into my archive and where it'll find the canonical link. Nice. Which is really important, for example, in the brain because the brain will detect in, uh, identical URLs and warn me, "Hey, you've already got this in your brain," but not if there's a bunch of cruft at the end because it doesn't it doesn't d differentiate. Right. Yeah, the only way to really truly a hundred percent be sure you're resolving it appropriately is to crawl the page. Unfortunately. Mm -hmm. um, because there are older CMSs that actually use the URL query as navigational stuff. Um, but yeah, that's a whole other problem. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, are there other things off the agenda that we'd like to tackle in a little bit of time we've got left? Or other open questions that are FOTLE? So I guess uh, on the just closing on the uh, notes aspect. Uh, so Adam, I think you you said like Chris that you are like working on the private uh, uh, public split, no? Uh, uh, but the, are you so essentially you're using you're still targeting Markdown on it? Uh, yes. Uh, go go. Just yeah. Checking. Yeah, yeah. I I am like I had a file loss problem many years ago, so. Nowadays, everything I write that I want to keep goes in Dropbox and Git, um, which has caused some interesting Dropbox problems. But it, <laughs> it does work sufficiently to keep everything backed up. Yeah. Plain text is very nice. That's nice. And, and you, Bentley, what do you use for notes? I only use my physical brain. <laughs> 
So I I I do not have a repository notes repository. Um, I was I um, I'm Bentley and I uh, do not have a second brain. <laughs> Hi Bentley. Uh, confessing to that <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> in this group, uh, it's definitely a problem. Uh, the the closest thing I have right now is is my blog has some markdown, but actually like half the pages are straight HTML because I'm doing things markdown doesn't support because I'm mm -hmm. demoing front end stuff, which also kind of begs the question. Markdown technically supports HTML in many versions. Do y'all know whether in your uh, future world what level of HTML support you're gonna allow? Uh, I think this is something very interesting to discuss maybe next time uh, also with Peter. I don't know how uh, uh, he's thinking about this for MassiWiki. I think, uh, so sanitizing HTML, sanitizing HTML is like hard, but I'm also like not uh, concerned about security for the other because it doesn't have anything, it doesn't have a user. If, if you're trusting, yeah, it's all about trust, right? If, if right. you're, if you're, if it's a closed group, then, then yeah, or not closed, but you know, where, where someone's looking at it, and um, so, I mean, I if, if we want to play around, I could use my blog as a data source. Um, I've actually been wanting to write massive wiki in JavaScript and take it out of the Python just because I can't stand having Python um, on my computer. <laughs> uh, but that's me. Um, yeah. Because right now I'm using 11T to generate my blog, but it's, it's mostly using um, uh, Markdown. So uh, that is my file of choice. So I could use that as a as a as a demo piece, but I might just hang around and see how I can help out. And then some of our other stuff, I guess, like since doing, we have a website for that, and we probably need to move that to to Massive Wiki instead of Google at some point. Mm -hmm. Um, I did a, I think I mentioned a couple of experiments I did with SeedWiki long ago, but one of them was to create a blog inside a wiki, and I really like that. Um, and I haven't seen that really kind of done any place. But what we did was um, we took one page on the wiki and said, this, anybody coming here, this, this page will look like a blog. And then what that page was, was a list of the other pages on the wiki that were entries in the blog. And uh, effectively, uh, and I don't remember if we did this or not, but the other way to do this is to just have a tag that you put on blog entry pages in the wiki namespace. And all the blog page does is go find every page that has that tag, sort them chronologically, put between matter between all the blog posts. So end matter on the previous blog about ratings and retweets and previous, you know, and a, and a header on the next blog post and then stream them together. And voila, you have a blog except every entry is now a wiki page, which could be improved over time, could be whatever. And here we get into the really interesting discussion that Pete and others were having about, um, could there be a canonical page reference? And, uh, and I'm, I think I'm using the wrong language here, but, but you know, as pages change over time, do you want to, how do you mark special versions of the page so that they become more or less permanent or very visible? How do you allow for change or prohibit change given whatever the context uh, or, or purpose is for the pages. But I, I wish that all blogs were sort of wikis um, and, and that every post was a wiki entry and we're off to the races. Mm -hmm. <coughs> yes, I know like uh, at least uh, in the digital garden uh, space, a lot of people seem to do, I mean, uh, this seem, seem to explore this wiki blog duality. Like some entries are like uh, notes and some are like journal entries or like anchored to a date and time. Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, and it's interesting because, yeah, it, it's sort of like, I guess, uh, simplify you, you both. What the algorithm does is it just tries to detect very simply like which notes look like dates or, or times. And then that shows in a, in a time view. You know what's what's interesting also so the blog uh, you mentioned going through all the files and p that are tagged a certain way i actually have several places on my blog where i'm tagged and i have metadata so i have like mm -hmm. projects and those are just 
kind of like wiki pages um, with metadata. And then there's a page that puts that on my home page. And then also what's interesting is I have metadata to say what, uh, what technologies they were built in. So then on the home page, there's little icons showing the, the for each of the items. And then there's also, when you go on the page themselves, there's the full name with the icon on the page itself. So that kind of repeating metadata, um, even though those, that's still kind of date specific, there's other stuff like people and stuff like that that is re repeating data. So mm -hmm. yeah, I kind of see a, a blog is just being a date repeating data. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I'm just brainstorming. Mm -hmm. I do have to head mm -hmm. out. I got another meeting. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks, Bentley. Yeah. On the talk, yeah. Um, and if, if you guys don't have anything you want to turn over, we can hold this meeting now or I'm happy to